By the end of the story, the protagonist Leonard has finally killed the villain, Teddy, aka John G. In our protagonist's eyes, the antagonist of the story is now defeated. This is how the story ends, however it is also how the film starts. The first time you watch Memento you might ask yourself, how does the story arrive to this conclusion? However on your second viewing, or your third, your fourth, or probably your last, you ask yourself a new question. What does Leonard want? A purpose to live? Or a resolution for the conflict? Memento is a 2002 neo-noir psychological thriller written and directed by Christopher Nolan based on the short story Memento Mori written by his brother Jonathan Nolan. The film is about a man, Leonard, who is on a path of vengeance as he seeks the man responsible for his wife's murder, John G. However, Leonard cannot make new memories or long-term memories. Thus he conditions himself to create a system of photographs with identities and locations with tattoos all over his body, which will eventually lead him to the killer. Also with the help of an undercover police officer, Teddy, and a bartender named Natalie. Before we cover this question, first we need to look at how reality is distorted within Memento. Leonard's goal in the film is to find the killer. But without a purpose to live his life in his condition, he is constantly distorting his own reality to continue an endless quest. Leonard manipulates himself to find a purpose to exist by distorting his own past, present, and future. This is created through its structure, its characters, and further explored in its themes. First, let's look at the structure. This is a typical film that plays forward in time. Sometimes it might have flashbacks, sometimes it doesn't. In a common film, time is always moving forward. This is Memento. Within the screenplay, Nolan wanted the structure of the film to replicate Leonard's experience of living in the moment and not remembering what has happened beforehand. The first scenes of the film set up the pacing of the narrative itself. Nolan has said in an interview that this visual structure is the best representation of the story. With the black and white scenes moving forward in time with 1, 2, and 3, and the colored scenes playing reversed with V, U, and T. Each scene from one timeline then alternates with the other timeline. This is the structure of the film, as it ends with both timelines colliding in the film's midsection at B22. Working with the editor, Dottie Dorn, each colored scene in Memento gives a brief overlap of visual and audio cues to allow the audience catch up on where they are in the story, whether it is familiar props, dialogue, or imagery. As repetition is used by Leonard to remember his routines, the film mirrors this use of repetition of story elements to make the audience aware of what's going on. And repetition of events and encounters allow for exposition as well. With this structure, it is easy to mislead audiences and distort the reality within the film. We meet characters that are friendly at first and reveal that they are manipulative. We enter situations where neither the protagonist nor the audience knows what's going on. The reality the audience is presented with in the first few scenes is the reality they accept. We have a reliable protagonist with a goal we want him to reach, a woman who wants to help him out of pity, and we have our villain in sight. With the way the film is structured, we assume this is all true. We are not given any information beforehand on to where the facts came from or in what context. Not only is Leonard's experience of short-term memory recreated and explored, but also his attitude towards memories and facts. Throughout the film, the audience is given hints about what Leonard has done, and how he has gotten to where he is. With every bit of information released within the narrative, Leonard becomes an untrustworthy protagonist who is blinded by facts that he truly believes are reliable. Lenny. You can't trust a man's life to your little notes and pictures. Why not? Because your notes could be unreliable. Memory's unreliable. Ah, oh, please. No, 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 really. Ask Memory's not perfect. It's not even that good. Ask the police. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable. That's the cops don't catch a killer by sitting around remembering stuff. Right. They, they collect know. facts. That's not what I'm they make notes and they draw conclusions. Facts, not memories. That's how you investigate. Look, memory can change the shape of a room. It can change the color of a car. And memories can be distorted. They're just an interpretation. They're not a record. And they're irrelevant if you have the facts. Apart from acting as a detective, he also can be a representation of law and order. His blue shirt, a common color used by police figures, his determination to seek justice, and only following facts and evidence. 
The current actions of Leonard are driven by information and facts that he keeps and that he constantly relies on. The camera used by Leonard is a Polaroid camera. He uses it as a storage of memories and as a system to keep track on identities and facts. Within the opening shot of the film, we see Teddy's body on the floor in a Polaroid picture. And since the scene is reversing in time, the picture fades. Truth and reality fades away, just as his memories. Once information is tampered with or manipulated, Leonard's actions and journey is affected, just as he tricked himself into believing that Teddy is the John G that killed his wife. Because of his condition, he is often questioned by others where the information comes from, but he doesn't stop to question himself. Deception is another tool used by the characters to manipulate Leonard's perception of reality. Two of the closest identities to Leonard is Teddy and Natalie with facts written on the back of the photos. The theme of deception is presented as the audience is introduced to Natalie. As we first see her, she is wearing sunglasses. Glasses are a common prop within the noir genre to hide one's identity. She later takes it off with a close-up on the glasses on the table, further emphasizing that the glasses represent deception. It is later revealed in the film that she tricks Leonard into helping her kill Dodd, a local drug dealer. Natalie holding the key to Leonard's motel room also signifies her power over Leonard. In different sections of the scene where Natalie manipulates Leonard, we know that Natalie left to see Dodd and was confronted about the money of a drug deal gone wrong, and she takes advantage of Leonard once she returns. You didn't believe me. You said if I don't have the drugs by tomorrow, he's gonna kill me, and then he just, he just started hitting me. Where is he? Why? I'll go see him. And? I'll give him some bruises of his own and tell him to look for a guy called Teddy. This is the reality we are presented with. However, a couple of minutes ago, this is what happened. Pathetic piece of shit. I can say whatever the fuck I want, and you won't have a fucking clue, you fucking retard. Shut your mouth. I'm going to use you. I'm telling you now because I'm going to enjoy it so much more if I know that you could stop me if you weren't such a fucking freak. We'll still be best friends. Maybe even lovers. I'll see you soon. Our perception of Natalie changes at this point through the position of these scenes. Just as Leonard has been manipulated into thinking Natalie as an ally, the audience is also tricked. Teddy was a police officer assigned to the murder of Leonard's wife. One year after the incident, he has been using Leonard throughout that year to kill drug dealers with names like John G and steal their money. Cheer up. There's plenty of John G's for us to find. Within the black and white scenes, Teddy uses a process of manipulation to get Leonard to kill local drug dealers, while also reminding him of the harsh truth by the end of the objective, a repetitive process he uses to manipulate Leonard. Only in this story, Leonard deceives himself with information into thinking Teddy is the real John G to stop this cycle of manipulation. Now that we have covered how reality is distorted within Memento, hence affecting Leonard's journey, let's go back to the first question. What does Leonard want? A purpose to live or a resolution for a conflict? He killed my wife. He took away my fucking memory. He destroyed my ability to live. You living? Only for revenge. Since revenge is his purpose to live, Leonard's perception of reality is distorted from the very beginning. Just as Teddy says, to create a problem he can never solve. As he was the one who removed the 12 pages from the police report, killed the original John G a year ago, framed Teddy, and conditions himself into believing that he didn't kill his wife with the Sammy Jenkins storyline. By the end of the film, he drives his car to a tattoo parlor, he imagines he is with his wife and a tattoo is visible on his chest with the phrase I've done it in a dream sequence. This can signify two things. Either it means he killed his wife with the insulin overdose or that he killed John G and that his journey has finished. Either way, this is the reality he wants to see. A resolution. But it is not what he will find. As Teddy reminds him, you, you wander around, you're playing detective. You live in a dream, kid. A dead wife to pine for. A sense of purpose to your life. A romantic quest that you wouldn't end even if I wasn't in the picture. 
Leonard's perception of reality is distorted through the narrative structure, the facts that he relies on, and the people that manipulate him. Leonard's reality is constantly changing while also living in an endless cycle that he can never leave.